chapter in Isaiah. It's actually quite beautiful. This is Isaiah 26. It says, in that day, this song will be sung in the land of Yehudah or Judah. What song is that? We have a strong city. I have no idea how it's going to sound like, but Yahuwah will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation, which keeps the truth, you see that which guards the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Verse four, trust in Yahuwah forever. For in Yah, Yahuwah is everlasting strength. I wanted to point out, you will keep him in perfect peace. Uh, you look at the Hebrew of that. You know, it simply says shalom, 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 double portion. And when you look at the word mind, okay, so shalom, shalom. Remember, there's two shaloms. That's perfect peace, right? And the word after the shalom, shalom is yetzah, yetzer. That is, uh, in the English, it's mind. But in the Hebrew, that means the forming, the framework. Purpose. You see that? And the other definition below, it says purpose or imagination. A lot of the wording there, and actually that exact Hebrew word is the same word that's found in Genesis 2, 7. And this is the, in the creation of Adam, the garden, right? And Yahuwah Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground. So that same word, yatsar, is in this particular verse. This Adam, he is formed after the Most High. So we talked last time about how important it is for us to understand the three piece. What I mean by that is the person, the place, and the position. Because when we understand the three piece, we will have a deeper understanding of how we can be a good steward of what Yahuwah has given us. And that is the breath of life. So that's the nashama that we've been sort of talking about the last couple of weeks, right? And if you look, and, and I say earlier, this is the greatest time for us to understand this because what's evident before us today is attack on the breath. And we've talked about that, like the masking, right? So there's an attack on the breath. So this is very timely for us to be really unpacking the nashama of Yahuwah and how that nashama is, is actually the enabler for us to be able to sing that new song that we see the remnants sing in Revelation 14, right? The three Ps are the person. And why is that important? Because the person is who we are. It's our identity right? 
it's who we are and whose we are okay the second piece the place so what is the place that means what we take possession of what is our inheritance what's been set aside for us a set apart place for example the garden of eden is a place that the most high pitched or separated or put adam into right and what happens is everyone is you, you've heard this everyone is called but not everyone says yes to that inheritance to that possession right so so that's another layer that we're going to study and if you want to look at that as the earth what has been given to us to rule over it's the earth so if you look at the earth and all you do is and move the letter h and move it to the front all of a sudden it becomes the heart and you're actually going to see that that is a part of the genesis 2 story and i'll show you where that is but the thing about the heart is that once it's defiled it needs to be recreated it can't be um, it can't just be renewed. The scripture says that the heart is so desperately wicked. Who can know it? So something about the possession or the earth or the place that we need to understand. That's why in Revelation, the scripture says there will be a new heaven and new earth. Person, place, and the third is position. So it's important for us to understand position because that's where our authority lies. So the authority we have is in the nashama is in the breath, the spirit of the most high. And so if you look at Psalm 51, I'll show you a quick difference. It says here, verse 10, create in me a clean heart. Okay, that word create is bara, bara. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. So spirit or energy, the law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So there's something in us <laughs> that actually was given to us, was loaned to us by the Most High, okay? So that part of us cannot be destroyed. It can be renewed though. It has to be renewed. The heart part can be defiled. So once, once the heart is defiled, it has to be recreated, okay? And I'll explain what that means in a bit. But it's interesting to note here it says, renew a steadfast spirit within me. So the word renew is the word in Hebrew, kadash. Kadash. It is the same word that, that is referred to in Revelation 14, where the remnant sang a new song. So it's a new song, a new song. So kadash um, also is very close to the word kadosh. And you know, kadosh in Hebrew means set apart. So something about this, our spirit needs to be refreshed, renewed, okay, repair. The difference between spirit and heart, heart, once it's defiled, it needs to be completely made new, but the spirit needs to be refreshed, renewed. So um, what's the difference between spirit and soul? When it comes to spirit, and why is it that it needs to be renewed? It's connected to iniquity, okay? So iniquity, and I'll explain this a little bit more, is simply going outside of Yahuwah's will. Once we find ourselves outside of the will of Yahuwah, then we are in iniquity. But there's a process involved in that, and I'll explain that in the story of Satan. But what I wanted to really get us to understand is it's so important for us to know the difference between our spirit, soul, and body. Why? Because we need to understand the person or who we are, our identity. Our identity is also going to manifest. It's going to be expressed in a certain place. Like if, if I don't have um, a place to express my identity in, it's how good is that, right? And then when you look at the combination of your identity and your position, the combination of that yields to your authority. And remember, we talked about 1 Thessalonians 5, where it says that we have to know we are called to sanctify ourselves, our entire being, our spirit, soul, and body, because there is a 
preservation call, and there's also a blamelessness that comes with the being set apart, right? And so, just so you know, also Job talks about this. So Job, Job 27.3, Job breaks down to us that we are made up of three parts, right? So Job, if you want to write this down, Job 27.3, he says, all the while my nashama is in me. In your translation, it'll say spirit is in me. And the spirit of Yah is in my nostrils. So very similar to what Adam was saying, right? So all the while, my spirit is in me or my nashama. And then Job 27.2 says, as Yah lives, who hath taken away my judgment and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul. So he also talks about a soul part. And then Job 19, 25 and 26, Job says this beautiful thing. He says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see yet. Our bodies have a mind. Our soul has a mind. Okay. So we perceive twice. But what is the will of Yahuwah? Is for us to hear his one voice. Okay. So uh, Romans 8. So what do I mean? Our flesh actually has a mind of its own. Romans 8 says, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the word carnal there, carnally, in Greek is flesh. It's sarks. As far as the soul, we are to love Yahuwah with all our heart, all our soul and our mind. There is this aspect that our soul also has a perception of its own. Does our spirit have a mind? Yes. Job 32.8 says, but there is a spirit in man. And the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. So the breath here is nashama. And the nashama is what gives us the inspiration. It's so important for us to see that because if you look at body and spirit, Paul says that there's a, a battle between flesh and spirit. What is caught in between? It's our soul. So if you look at Psalms 103, it says, Praise Yahweh, O my soul, and all that is within me. And if you look at the Hebrew of that, it means uh, within me. It means kereb or midst, among, in the middle. Right? So in other words, there is a battle going on, and it is after our soul. Okay, so now if you look at iniquity, if we, we study iniquity, for us to understand why it's so important for us to really know our identity in our Messiah, right? We have to look at where iniquity started. So if you look at this passage here, it, it's talking about the king of Tyre. So we know that there's a shift. In the early chapter here, it's talking about the prince of Tyre. So it's this earthly ruler. As we know, the rulers on the earth, there's if they are not of Yahuwah, then they're being moved by a like a by a, a divine being behind the scene. So we know that Satan here is being described before his fall. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says Yahuwah Elohim, you are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. So if you look at the seal of perfection. That word seal of perfection, the Hebrew word in the word seal is katam. So katam means it is affixed, it is fastened, okay? It's like locked up. He's created in this fixed state of perfection. So when you look at the word perfection, in other uh, translation, it's, it says the sum. In Hebrew, it's tokneith. Tokneith means patterned. S.A. Tan was created, affixed in this pattern. What is that pattern? If you look further in the Hebrew, it's a token, a measurement, right? So S.A. Tan is made, 
patterned after a token of the Most High. He's affixed to that. So why was he made patterned, patterned after the Most High? If you look at this further, it'll say you were in Eden, okay, the Garden of Yah. And then it talks about every precious stone that he had that was prepared for him. And we also see that he has a, a pipe or, you know, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. And this is where scholars believe that he, um, he led worship in heaven. But what he was doing was he was the anointed cherub who covers. He covers the throne of the Most High. So he's nearest to the Most High. So he was established. So that word established is the same as the affixed. That was his portion. That was his purpose. And you, you notice how it's past tense, right? So this is a recount of what, it, what he was prior to the fall. So he was on the holy mountain of Yah, and he walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. I want you to pay attention to the word mountain of Yah and in the midst, because we're going to get back to that. I'm going to show you that it's the same thing in Eden, in, in Genesis 2. If you look at the word tire in Hebrew, the word tire actually means rock. King of Tyre or Tyrus, it means a rock. You see that? He is made patterned after a portion of the Most High. So he's a rock and he has a job. His job is to represent, to reflect the glory of the Most High to the other stones. You see that? So the other angels. So he was in the midst and he went, walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. So a Satan is a, some kind of a fire, a fire being, right? And, and that's why in Isaiah 14, the word Ohelel, it actually also means translated as Lucifer. So Lucifer is a light bearer. So he's a, some kind of a fiery being. This Satan was perfect in his ways. In the day that he was created, he was perfect. And what do I mean by perfect? He was made complete because he was made complete in the purpose that the creator prepared for him. And that was to be the covering of his throne right? He was there to reflect because he was the one nearest to the most high. He was nearest to the most high. So when he turns around, all of that reflection, that light, all that goodness, he's supposed to, when he turns around to the rest of the angelic beings, the rest of the congregation of angels, if you think about it, he's reflecting the most high. But because what happened was this, he was created privileged in a sense, if you think about it. Because of that, something was found in him. Iniquity was found in him. What is iniquity? Iniquity, simply put, is to be outside of Yahuwah's will. So we see a part of that in Isaiah 14, right? And this is called, dubbed as the fall of Hillel or O Lucifer, right? How you were fallen. What happened to him? Why is iniquity found in Hillel, because he said in his heart, when we say something, right, we, nothing we say is random. It all came, it all, it is all sourced from our being, from our heart. And everything that we say, everything that we express comes from a collection of related thoughts that we have started to think. So this is not something that is, this is not a knee jerk reaction, right? He, he's been, Pondering about this. Oh, this is cool. You know, I, I, I get to have, I get to reflect and then I turn around and, you know, wow, everyone is bowing down or whatever, right? But, but obviously the angels are designed to worship the Most High. But what did S.A. Tan do or Lucifer in this context here? It says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. See, you see how I will, I will, I on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So iniquity was found in him because he took upon himself to 
instead of being in the purpose, instead of existing in the purpose that the creator gave him, according to Ezekiel 28, he now came up with his own purpose. He took his own will rather than the will of the Most High, right? So this is the origin of iniquity that we know of that's been revealed to us in the scripture. What does that now have to do with what we're talking about? For me to understand who I am, like what Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians, that we are called to be sanctified in our entire being, our spirit, soul, body, right? Because we are going to be preserved and we're going to be blameless unto the coming of our master, Yahusha, right? And it's, it's amazing. I actually started to see this in the garden. So you've heard me say that Adam is a type of spirit. Eve is a type of soul. And the flesh, okay, the flesh, fallen flesh, is used as a typology of the serpent, okay? So is it just me that came up with that? No, actually, Paul uses the same typology. So Paul, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verse 45, it says, Though it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And then he used the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So he uses the same word, Adam. And I know, we know that that's, he's talking about Yahushua there. But the point is, and there's a re, it's a really good there's a really smart reason why he said it like the way he did. Um, so Adam is a type of our spirit. Now, when it comes to Eve as a type of our soul, if you look at the word transgression, I want to show you something here. Paul talks about, he refers to Adam as a type of Messiah. Romans 5. Paul says something interesting here. He says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moshe, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. That kind of confused me back then. And I'm like, why would Adam be used as a type of Messiah? And not only that, how come it says like in the likeness of the transgression of Adam? So if you look at the word transgression, Parabasis, parabasis in Greek. It means going over. And if you look further down, the word transgression to pass over. So that's in Greek. Let me show you in, in the Old Covenant. Okay, let's choose this one. Exodus 34, 7. The word transgression means uh, in Hebrew is pesha. When we celebrate the Feast of Yahuwah, what kicks off the spring feast? We know it as Pesach, right? Doesn't that sound similar to the word Pasha? So if you continue to look at the etymology of Pasa, you see to step forward. So point being is um, Adam's transgression, okay, what he was doing, um, he was just like what Yahusha did at Passover is my point right? How he's the Passover lamb, how, you know, when, when the Israelites were um, given the command to put the blood on the doorpost, that they were covered by the blood. And so that when the death angel came by, they were kept alive. So th that's the little clue that we have as to what's the purpose of Adam? Why would Paul say that he's a type of Messiah? This is why we are to study to show ourselves approved, right? Because when you look at the word transgression, the first thing that you think about is it's a bad thing. And I'm not saying that it's not, but I'll, I'll give you one more example. So Psalm 51. Psalm 51 here, this is David, and he uses the word uh, Psalm 51, 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. You see that word purge is kata in Hebrew. Now, the word sin, okay, I'm going to now look at this word sin. In Hebrew is also kata. You see that? And if you look at the root word of that, it's the exact same word that David used to purge me with hyssop. So 
Kata is to miss the mark, miss the way, but also purify. You see that? Purify from uncleanness. You've heard the saying where what the enemy has done for evil, Yahuwah turns it around for good. As you can see in the, the verbiage of the Hebrew underneath the English words, there's a good reason why we should be studying the word, right? So let me get back to my point. We talked about the origin of iniquity in the typology that Paul makes when it comes to our spirit, soul, body. Eve is a type of soul. And Paul uses the same thing. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Paul says, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds or so your soul should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Mashiach. We know that the scripture says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Okay, so Paul uses Eve as a type of our soul because our soul is our mind, our desire, our, our intellect, right? Our emotion. So this is our own free will. Paul also uses the serpent as a type of corruptible flesh. So in Romans 7.23, you're going to see that it says, Paul says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. You see that? Uh, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul is talking about his member, his fleshly nature that there is a law of sin. So that law of sin was established by who, right? That's the question. Who established that law of sin? Let's go back to the garden and let's make the connection with S.A. 10 birthing iniquity in a sense, and then Adam. So in Genesis 2, verse 7, remember that there is a person a place and position. And you're going to see the three Ps right here in Genesis 2. One thing that we need to clarify in our minds, the Garden of Eden is actually high up. It's a mountain. The clue is here. Genesis 2, 6. It says, but a mist went up from the earth. That word, but there went up. Allah. Allah means to climb up, to go up, to ascend. So that's just a little clue, right? But your other confirmation is in Ezekiel 28, right? Because it says there that you were in the garden, the mountain of Yah. I'm trying to paint the picture that the garden is not like the garden in the backyard somewhere. This is on a mountain. That's the scenery, right? So if you look at a mountain, there's, there's clouds in the mountain, right? There's, that's what that mist that goes up. And the word mist I showed you is firebrand. That's an interesting one as well. Well, anyway, verse 7. And Yahuwah Elohim formed man. So that same word that we looked at earlier, Yetzar, of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or the nashama of life. And man became a living being. This speaks to the person of Adam. And what's special about Adam is that he is from the dust of the ground, right? So if you look at, in comparison, Satan is a fire being, Adam is a, is a dust being. <laughs> Could it be that because of what happened to Satan and he was made in perfect, sealed in perfection or in completeness, that the purpose of why Adam was made was to purge iniquity? Could it be? Adam is made lower than the angel because the angels, as we know, is in a different dimension. But this is now we're speaking of on earth. But this is not just on earth. This is higher ground. So uh, the Garden of Eden before the fall was literally heaven on earth. Verse 7 speaks of the person of Adam. The place where Adam was put in is his possession. Okay. So here you, we see that the place that comes with who he is, that comes with Adam, is described in verse 8. Yahuwah Elohim planted a garden eastward in Eden, and then he put the man 
whom he had formed. So the word planted here is nata, and it, it actually has established fixed. You see that word again, fixed, right? Fixed. The better way to translate this so that we can understand it is pitch. So Yahuwah pitched a garden. And garden in Hebrew is gan or enclosure. So Yahuwah Elohim pitched an enclosure in Eden. So I'm trying to say enclosure. I want to use the word tent because it is the same thing, right? So if you look at... Um, if you look at all throughout the scripture, you're going to see like Abraham has a tent. Jacob has a tent. Shem has a tent. Sarah has a tent. Rebecca. So all these people that we're supposed to learn from, we see that they have a tent. And in Adam's case, this is his hint of his tent. So what's special about the tent? So if you look at the word, oh, and I, I do want to also mention, you've heard Tabernacle of David, right? Tabernacle of David, in the scripture, tabernacle and tent is sort of used interchangeably. But there is a difference. Tent or ohel is one thing. And the tabernacle of Moses, the one that was erected, um, given to Moses from the mountain of Yah, that's called a mishkan. So mishkan is different from ohel. So here in Isaiah 16, you're going to see something here that's interesting. Tabernacle of David is Ohel. So what is Ohel? Ohel is a, a tent, a nomad's tent. And if you look further down, you're going to see that it also is to be clear or to shine. So the tabernacle of David, the tent of David is a place to shine to be clear, to have no veil, to have no separation. <laughs> so, and why is it specifically called Tabernacle of David? Because the word David means beloved. You see that? So the tent of beloved. So I hope you're thinking bride of Mashiach in a second, right? But Genesis 2, let's go back. So in Genesis 2, we see that um, there is the person of Adam in verse 7 that describes Adam's identity, who he is. Okay, He is special because the breath of the Most High was breathed into his nostrils. And he comes from the dust of the ground. So... That means he has a special purpose. He became a living being. He has a special um, job to do, right? So verse 8 is the place. It's like a tent. So Yahweh Elohim pitched a tent, a garden in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. So the word put there again is fixed. So he put the man soon. He appointed. You see that? He appointed Adam. So it is in the place where we get our, uh, our anointing, our being set apart. So in other words, uh, Adam was put in an enclosed place to be protected from something outside. So my question is, what is that being or that force that is outside that Yahuwah is protecting Adam in. So he was appointed, and then out of the ground, Yahuwah Elohim made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. Remember in Ezekiel 28, we were looking at a Satan, and he was also walking up and down, and he was in the midst of the fiery stones. So Adam here is special. He was put in charge. He was put in a place where there's tree of life. And that tree of life is put in the midst of the garden. But what's different about Adam is that he wasn't born, in a sense, privileged like Satan. 
Satan was created privileged. Like he already had the, the, the seal. He was locked up in the pattern of the measurement of the Most High. He was put in there. But Adam is different. He was put in a garden where he has access to a tree of life in the midst of the garden. But we know what happened that in Revelation, so in Revelation 22, it says that the tree of life now has to be, you have to earn the right to partake from it. So the difference between Satan and Adam is that Adam needs to be proven first. And I'm ignoring the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for a reason, Raquel, just so you know. <laughs> so now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it parted and became four river heads. This is the first instance in my imagination of the human heart. So if you look at our hearts, our hearts is um, formed after the letter Shin. That's one, right? Plus our hearts also have four chambers. So what's happening here is this, right? Um, the tent that Adam was put in is like, because it's like heaven on earth, right? It's like you would compare that to our brain, to our mind. But what was happening here is that the brain is connected to the heart. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. In other words, Adam was put in a place where there's, he was literally one. He was walking in the, you know, in the cool of the day with the Creator. His heart was one with his thoughts. Like this is the pre-fall setting of what the Garden of Eden looked like, right? But we haven't touched purpose yet. So we've touched the person in verse 7. We've touched the place. What is the position of Adam? We're going to see that in verse 15. So, and, and verse 16, you can argue, right? So verse 15 says, And Yahuwah Elohim took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Yahuwah Elohim took the man i want you need to see the word took because you've heard me say that adam is the first malki zadik right so if you look at the story of malki zadik you're going to see in exodus 19 that when um the children of israelites were uh told by moses to be ready to make themselves ready for in three days yahweh is going to descend on the mountain right to meet with them to propose to give them a marriage proposal. So the children of Israelites, they were to be married, to be entering into a marriage covenant with the Most High. In the story of Adam, this is what I mean, where you gotta, there's subtleties in the scripture that you gotta look into, right? Yahuwah Elohim, and by the way, him going down or bending downwards to grab soil from the ground is a form of him descending from above so it's the same thing in exodus 19 where he descended and met with the children of israelites and moses on the mountain so in the same context here when yahweh was creating adam the fact that he went down this is this is special he went down to to collect soil or dust from the ground and then he breathed the breath of life into Adam. So that's special. That's Yahweh descending down. So lowering himself down in kindness. In other words, that's mercy, right? But I wanted to point this out to you. We're now talking about position. So Yahweh Elohim took the man. So the word took in Hebrew is lakak. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it incorrect. The word lakach, look at this. To take to acquire, to buy, to bring, to marry, to take as a wife. See that? To or for a person, to procure, to take possession of, to select, to choose, to take in marriage. So that word took is a lot more than the word took. So Yahuwah Elohim took the man or, in a sense, brought him into a marriage covenant. And 
put him, so placed him. So that word put, again, is yanak. Yanak, oh, here's the beautiful thing. When Yahuwah took Adam and put him in a marriage covenant, he put the man Adam into the Garden of Eden so he can rest, so he can experience Sabbath, so he can Shabbat, rest to settle down, to remain, to be quiet. What was he doing? Yahuwah wanted Adam to enter into that state of rest, to settle down, because Yahuwah was going to prepare him to do something. Adam was put in the Garden of Eden for to tend it and keep it. So to tend means to work it, but not in the same way that we understand hard labor today. To work it, in other words, because he, went up, he was in a place of perfection, right? Like heaven on earth, married. So this is what the Garden of Eden is. Heaven and earth in a marriage form, right? Um, but he was put there, Adam was put there to beautify the place. That's what to work it means. To beautify him, to beautify the place, and to keep it to guard it. That's what the word shamar is, right? So this is Adam's purpose, is to beautify the place and to guard it. That's just a part of his purpose. And so because he's given that job, Yahuwah Elohim commanded Adam, notice that the commandment of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Note that when Yahuwah gave the commandment, it was to Adam directly. So there is no, no woman at this point. Why is it that I'm making the connection between Esetan, where Esetan was created in, uh, in completeness? And because he was made in completeness, something happened to Esetan. He ended up uh, conjuring up pride, right? That's what he ended up conjuring up. And then that pride turned into iniquity. Proverbs 6, it talks about there's six things that Yahuwah hates, you know, right? That's called the, the seven deadly sins, right? But seventh is the worst, right? But anyway, the first on the list is pride. If you think about it, how come angels or Satan, they don't qualify for atonement? Why is it that they don't qualify for atonement? Um, and if you think about what Satan did and his level of influence bringing down a third of the angelic congregation with him, Satan did something that was unforgivable in a sense. And if you look at um, Matthew 12, 25, you know, this is where Yahuwah is talking about every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, right? So if you look at a kingdom, there is a part that happened in SA 10 and what he did that is non-negotiable. There's absolutely no compromising because you're touching on the most high's justice and judgment, right? So let's, let's turn um, to Matthew 12, 25. I wanna show you what I mean. Yahusha is addressing a being called Beelzebub. So if you look at Beelzebub, that is basically a Satan. But he says something here in 27th and he says, or 25th, he says, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. It says every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So what Satan was doing, he was coming against the spirit of Yahweh. If, if you look further down, and this is dubbed as the unpardonable sin. Matthew 12, 31, therefore I say to you, in every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven man but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven man. Anyone who speaks a word against the son of man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, is, it will not be forgiven him, 
either in this age or in the age to come. So the, the blasphemy against the Ruach will not be forgiven in, a, in an earth and in the terrestrial level when it comes to man. The same thing is true because it's repeated twice. It says, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. So in other words, this is aeon. This is more than just the earth that we're familiar with, right? So what is the sin against the spirit or the blasphemy, I should say, speaking against the Holy Spirit, right? So then if you want to understand the Ruach of, of Yahuwah, you go to Isaiah 11. So Isaiah 11 is the spirit of Yahuwah shall rest upon Yahusha and the spirit of wisdom, understanding counsel, might, knowledge, and the reverence of Yahweh. So we see that there are seven spirits of Yahuwah, which is given to us in a way we can understand it via a menorah. Look at a menorah. It has the main vine, and then it branches off. So this is the seven spirit of Yahuwah. But what a Satan did was come against this, and what he did was Proverbs 6. These six things Yahuwah hates. Yes, seven are an abomination. The first one on the list is a proud look, right? So what I'm trying to say is, as they tanned, what he did, he doesn't qualify for atonement because he's now trampled with something that goes against the principle of a house being divided. And it cannot stand, cannot stand. So when it comes to Adam, Yahuwah is doing something different with Adam. He's being prepped to be proven with Adam. So his proving will come by way of testing. And we're going to see that that testing brings about repentance. And when repentance comes about, that is, there is humbleness attached to that, right? So humility and all of that translates to reverence of Yah. Whereas if you look at Satan, he was created privileged. And because he's created privileged, there's pride that he conjured up. And there's no fruit of repentance because the fullness of Yah has been revealed to him in the heavenlies. The pride equals no reverence of Yah. No reverence. What is now Yahuwah doing with Adam? I'm going to bring up Proverbs 16. So remember, we're dealing with iniquity. And we're going to end up talking about transgression and sin. I don't think we'll have time today. But Proverbs 16, 6, it says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. You see that? By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the reverence of Yahuwah, Men depart from evil. Yahweh is preparing to purge iniquity. He wants to purge iniquity. And how he's going to do that is through mercy and truth. Because what he's getting ready to prove in the person, in the place, in the authority or position of Adam is to bring about reverence of Yahuwah so that man will depart from evil. That reverence is that you will choose Yahuwah, right? So yeah, choice, Free, freely choose what is good, not like exactly, a robot. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? So, and, and so if you do a little bit of a, a word search of mercy and truth, you're gonna see something quite beautiful. So mercy and truth appears so in the exact phrase, mercy and truth, it appears 10 times in all throughout the Old Covenant, right? The Old Testament. And so, I don't know, to me, the 10 tribes, okay? But there's something about mercy and truth that we're going to unpack, okay? Mercy and truth, first of all, is who Yahweh is. Look at this, Psalm 89:14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. 
You see that? Now, in the context of Adam, and remember, he's a type of Messiah. He's the first Melchizedek, right? Mercy and truth preserve the king, and his throne is upholden by mercy. So mercy and truth is so powerful that, you know, even the angelic beings, this is a part of Yahuwah that they are still themselves discovering. And they are watching mankind as this part is unfolding before them. And so if you look at mercy and truth, all the paths of Yahuwah are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenants and his testimonies. You're going to see he shall abide before Yahuwah forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth, right? Now, here's the interesting part here. Psalm 85.10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So for Yahuwah to start illustrating mercy and truth, and he started with Adam. He's going to start with Adam. Adam has to, to fulfill this proving. And the proving ends up purging the iniquity. And the proving has to do with mercy and truth. So if you look at mercy and truth are met together. Mercy and truth are met together in Hebrew, pagash, right? Mercy and truth needs to encounter one another, to meet. So mercy and truth needs to encounter one another. And not only that, righteousness and peace. So if you look at righteousness is zadik, zadek, right? So that's malki zadik, right? And shalom have kissed. So the word kissed is to be put together, to be equipped, to handle. And if you continue looking at that, when mercy and truth meets, encounters one another, it basically, the product is righteousness and shalom. And when righteousness and shalom meet together, right, they come together, they create a burning, a kindling to make a fire to burn. So who is mercy and truth? And I'm going to propose to you, it is Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve is mercy and truth. So that's why we left off here. We said that Adam, the commandment of Yah, the truth, was only given to Adam. So remember, Eve has not come out yet. Eve has not come out yet. So, okay, one more thing I want to say. In Job, it's interesting. Job says something interesting about Adam. Okay, I'll show it to you. Job 31, 33. It says, I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Job is someone that is so learned, so deep in the revelation of who Yahweh is. And it's so beautiful to, to take what he says like there's a lot that job says that's really deep and it is hard to understand if if you don't understand what transfiguration means if you don't understand the story and purpose of adam all these things right but just set that aside for a second i wanted to bring up job 31 33 right if i covered my transgressions as adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom job is describing Adam here, Adam covered transgressions by hiding iniquity in his bosom. Think about that for a second. So uh, covered in Hebrew is to conceal, right? To hide, to clothe, right? So he covered his pesha. So remember we talked about pesha? passing over very close to the word Pesach, right? If I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, what Adam did was he hid iniquity in his bosom. I just want you to sort of consider that because that's not a complete, I haven't completed revealing that yet, but I just want to go back. I just wanted to highlight to you 
Job 31, 33, describing Adam covering transgressions by hiding iniquity in his bosom. And remember what we said about the word transgressions and sin and iniquity, how we got to really look at the Hebrew layers of definition of what that is, right? But what I wanted to say was mercy and truth. Mercy and truth is key to purging iniquity, okay? So if you look at um, what happened to a Satan in Ezekiel 28, in the Garden of Yah, where iniquity was found within him because he was created privileged and he that perfection that nearness to the throne of yahuwah that really got his pride going now that he sees yahuwah creating adam think about from a satan's perspective where adam is being created on the mountain as well adam is being created in an enclosure he is being created with a with the breath of the of the most high and he has a purpose and it has something to do with you know being an ambassador right do you think that a satan would be jealous of adam right so there's just a jealousy that's <laughs> that you can see by him watching Adam being created. And he's, he knows that Adam also is created perfect. Adam is created complete the same way as a Satan, right? A Satan at one point, he was complete, he was made complete. But the difference with Adam is that Yahuwah is going to use um, the uh, Malkizadik position of Adam to purge iniquity. That's the difference. And how he's going to do that is mercy and truth. But mercy and truth needs to meet each other, right? Because at right now, when the commandment was given in the garden, it was given directly to Adam. So Adam represents truth, right? Adam represents truth or the Torah or the commandment of Yah. Right. And, and when the truth was given to Adam, the woman was out of the picture. OK, so now. Mercy and truth needs to meet. So what does Yahuwah do? Yahuwah puts Adam to a deep sleep. And out of that deep sleep, he took one of his sides and closed it up instead. And there came from man a woman. Now, you got to look at the word deep sleep. This is not just like, like um, REM sleep. Something happened here. This is, and remember, Paul talks about a typology of who Adam is, right? Look at the word Yahuwah Elohim cause. So the word cause is to prostrate, to fall. Yahuwah allowed Adam to fall, to, to fall of a violent death, interesting, to prostrate. And then the word deep sleep, tardama. Tardama is deep sleep or a trance. And if you look further, that's radam, to be asleep, be unconscious. So what happened here? When um, Yahuwah Elohim caused this unconsciousness to fall upon Adam, he slept. And out of that, the woman came out of him. So now he calls his woman, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So my question is, what deep sleep is that? What is that a picture of? And do you see anywhere in the text that Adam was woken up out of that deep sleep? The person of Adam, he has 
the neshama of Yahuwah. He has the spirit of Yahuwah. He has, he's made up of flesh and a soul. So he's three parts. But something happened to Adam, right? And something was taken away from him. And that had to happen. Okay, that had to happen so that he can be prepared to enact, to prove mercy. Now, who do you think he's going to be merciful towards is my point. I want to sort of tie everything that I, that I talked about, and then I'll open up for us to share our thoughts. But I started off by, um, I guess, reminding us of the importance of knowing who we are, whose we are, that's the person, the place, the inheritance that has been reserved for us to take possession of. And also in combination of those two things, the authority that comes with that. And we looked at that and took the typology that Paul uses to take the story of Adam and Eve and make Adam a type of our spirit. Eve is a type of our soul and the corruptible flesh is a type of the serpent in the garden, right? And then um, we also looked at the purpose. Why, why did Yahuwah create Adam? And Yahuwah created Adam special. You know, he was created on higher ground. Adam was taken out of the ground, so out of the ground, and he was made into a vessel where Yahuwah can fill him, can form him with his image, with the most high's image, with the most high's character, the Nashama. And then what we did was we looked at Exodus 28 and we saw the origin of iniquity um, out of Satan. And basically we defined iniquity as being outside of the will of the creator. And we know that um, Satan conjured up pride that ultimately made him say the five I wills. So then the purpose that Yahuwah created him to be, he chose to come out of that purpose by saying the five I wills, right? So that's how iniquity was found in a Satan. So now, because there's this issue of iniquity, Yahuwah says in Proverbs 6, 10, I think, it says, mercy and truth is going to purge iniquity. So what I'm saying is in the story of Adam and Eve, we're going to see mercy and truth meet. They have to meet. And, and I was using Psalms 89. It says mercy and truth, when they meet together, when they met, re it results righteousness or zadik and shalom. And it says they have to kiss, right? So, and then now we ended up with going back to Genesis 2, where we see that the hint of truth represents Adam because truth is the law of Yahuwah, is the commandment of Yah. And we see that the commandment of Yah was given directly to Adam, away from Eve. Eve wasn't around yet, right? And then, but then it's not just truth, it's mercy and truth. So for Eve to meet Adam, Adam had to be put to a deep sleep so that Eve can come out of him, right? And out of that lesson, that Adam will be able to prove himself to be able to show mercy in combination with truth. And I know, I know a lot of what I'm saying probably isn't connecting yet. And I'm just sensitive of time. I want us, I want to just make sure that if there's any parts that's not clear, I want us to talk about it. But next Friday, I'm gonna talk about why is mercy and truth represented by Adam and Eve? What is the purpose? What are what is Yahuwah doing? Remember, because the Garden of Eden is created separate. It's created special. 
And really, this garden of enclosure is a place where you literally experience ikadness with Yahuwah. And when you are in ikad with Yahuwah, we all know Psalms 119, right? If you look at Psalms 119, this is the longest chapter in the 66 books. But one thing that Psalm 119 highlights is truth or Torah, right? And we know that it's broken down in 22 Hebrew alphabet, right? And so someone who loves Yahuwah, because, you know, the scripture says, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? So someone who loves Yahuwah, and by the way, we really don't know how to love Yahuwah. And that's why he gave us his commandments. This is a guide our expression of how we love him, right? Because Psalm 119 talks about the Torah, the commandment of Yah. But if you go back one chapter prior to, and you look at Psalm 118, before you can even really keep Torah, if you think about it, you cannot keep Torah in and of yourself. You have to be able to enter into a gate, gate of righteousness is where one must first enter in, right? So if you look at a tabernacle, there is one entrance there that is the gate of righteousness. So what that simply means is you are right standing, not on your own will, right? So you are entering into the right standing of Yahuwah. And you do that through the gate of righteousness. And we know that that is Yahusha. So what I'm trying to say is, if we're not found in the righteousness of our Mashiach, this is going to be very hard or impossible to do. If people are able to seemingly do it, they're doing it on their own strength. And it's going to fail, right? So... The point is, we have, we have to see that to approach the Most High, this is what I'm trying to say, for us to go back to the Garden of Eden, we have to see what happened first. We have to recognize the path to go back to the midst. So Psalm 118 talks about the gates of righteousness. So we have to go through that gate first. And then Psalm 119 all of a sudden becomes easy to follow, to do, because we're not doing it on our own strength. It's because it's we are doing it in the strength of our Mashiach, right? And then the other part that we don't often look at is the chapter after Psalms 119. And it's a short chapter, but what happens is once you're able to enter through the gate of righteousness and then you're able to live out Torah or the commandments of Yahuwah, the truth of Yahuwah, then all of a sudden, when we are distressed, I cried unto Yahuwah and he heard me. Wow. And deliver my soul, or Yahweh, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Sounds like the remnant in Revelation 14. Remember we talked about that? There's no lie found in their mouth. There's, they're blameless. So, and if you look at the context of this chapter, it's talking about war. <laughs> I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Think about that. So there is a war that's going on and Yahuwah is raising up an army and we are the army of Yahuwah that he wants to raise up. You know, you look at the garden and the garden is, it's on a high mountain and there's a mist or clouds in the setting of the Garden of Eden. And if you look at Revelation, it says here, and he hath, Revelation 1, 6, he hath made us kings and priests unto Yahuwah. The best translation of that is a kingdom of priests unto Yahuwah. You know, you have to understand King James did a really good job in trying to um, mess up our understanding. So it's hard for us to connect things. That's why he uses priests and priestesses. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> or, or a kingdom of priests. Right. In other words, it's a kingdom. It's a bride. Right. It's, and look at this. Behold, he comes with a cloud. So who is that cloud? Think about that. And, and if you look at the remnant. Witnesses. Okay. Yeah. Of witnesses. <laughs> yeah. And do you sort of understand where I'm coming from? So um, 
Now, unfortunately, since I wasn't like in the here in the beginning, I can only you know um, yeah. go over what was what was shared now. But there's something that I actually did want to say, um, which is somewhat of a side note. So yes. Psalms 120 is literally my testimony. That is that is a hundred percent how I got into the faith. That like that wow. whole chapter. So because I'm not going to go into the full detail, but when I lost everything, verse one, in my distress, I cried out to Yahuwah. I knew Yahuwah as the universe at the time, so I called out to the universe. And he answered me in five months, deliver my being from false lips, from a treacherous tongue. When I started to get into New Age religion and all other stuff, I was teaching everyone about what it meant to, you know, be the best you that you could be basically mm -hmm. and um people were getting on board with what i was sharing and all that stuff and you know i was basically being an antichrist figure um you know what would one give to you or what would one do to you oh treacherous tongue like i put myself mm -hmm. in a situation that allowed me to fall you know so then it made me think about like the whole Adam situation as, uh, that you were uh, bringing up. Sharp arrows of a mighty man with coals, of, uh, with coals of the broom with woe to me for I have sojourned in Meshech. I have dwelt among the tents of Kedar. I was with the wrong crowd, <laughs> you know, and then my being has dwelt too long with him who hates peace. That is also true. And I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for fighting. And now that I've been in the truth for as long as I have been, all I want to do is fight demons, basically. You know? So I just that 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 was great. So now I have something to add to my testimony, thanks to that. So um Yeah. So there's a um, comment, James, on what you just said. I I think that's amazing because I believe that that's Yahuwah giving you a revelation in advance. Like you've seen yourself as a finished product, the purpose, and now you're discovering more and more. Like your, mm -hmm. your soul is remembering all of that. Because in our spirit, man, we already know all this stuff. There's, you know, when we have the breath of Yahuwah instilled in us, and Yahuwah is all knowing. There's a part of us that knows all this, but our, rem our soul needs to remember. So that's what I'm saying. You got a, a revelation of, wow, who you are in advance. And now you're unpacking that in more intimate details. Because the more intimately you know him, the more you, oh, your totality of your being just wants to, you know, right? Just nothing. Absolutely. Go ahead. Sorry, James. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Now, while you're... Um uh rebuttaling to what i said uh i uh so unfortunately this week i did not get to do um any any studying um but uh, what i wanted to share though was um something in relation to the whole thing about uh songs right um and of course psalms is the i, I really do think is the blueprint to the uh the new song like there's there's just there's the way too much right mm -hmm. so um like for example i have three verses that i found um psalms 144 9 oh alahim i sing a new song i sing to you and here's mm -hmm. what i think is key on a harp of 10 strings <laughs> i sing praises to you right and then James, let me bring it up so that everyone can see it psalm 144 man that's yeah. beautiful yep all right and we're we got that okay and then there's also psalms 33 2 praise yahuwah with the lyre sing to him with an instrument of 10 strings is there again right mm -hmm. and then um my uh psalms 57 Seven, my heart is firm. O Alahim, my heart is firm. I sing in praise. Um, and uh, that's those are the three verses that I have as of right now. So I'm like, I'm uh, basically trying to dig as we go because um, this is this is what's been pulling me a little bit, you know. And since we understand that the song is also a journey. Um, it, it like both of them together uh I, I feel like they converge at the same end which is 
just beautiful. So, just, yeah. Quick comment. I don't know if you heard this part when I was sharing it earlier, but I, I think they all, do you remember, you remember I showed you Mercy and Truth? Mm -hmm. And I showed you Mercy and Truth appears in that, that exact phrase in King James Version. It appears 10 times in the New, in the Old Testament. And when I saw that, oh, wow. I'm like, out of 10, the 10 tribes, okay? And mm. one thing I want to highlight too, I love this Psalm 144, because if you look at the 144,000 in um, uh, Revelation 14, again, that's that 144,000 is, if you add four plus four is eight, plus one is nine. So again, it's the, these are the, the remnant who's been able to really live and walk and you know live out the fruit of the ruach and not only that the new jerusalem in uh revelation 21 the measurement of the new jerusalem is also 144 so i think it's mm. amazing that you are touching on this because there is so much more to this than what we you know, dub as a, just a new song, right? And mm -hmm. so go, yeah. So any, anyone else? Uh, there's actually one last thing, sorry, that I wanted to share. Um, uh, let's see, one, uh, four more verses, and they're all Psalms again. Love it. Psalms 98, eight. Let the rivers clap their hands. Yes. Let the mountains sing together for joy before Yahuwah. So again, we're seeing a different way in which nature by it doing and living by its natural course, sings praise to Yahuwah. Psalms 104, 12, the birds of the heavens dwell beside them. They sing from between the branches. Mm -hmm. Psalms 119, 172, my tongue sings of your word for all your commands. Our righteousness and then lastly one uh I, I brought this up before but i think it again it ties into everything psalms 137 4. how can we sing the song of yahuwah on foreign soil mm, wow wow that's awesome stuff wow you see that word song okay I, in in light of what you brought up i do want to sh bring up psalm 150. again it's a small six verse chapter but look at this the verse six here it says let everything that hath breath praise yahuwah and that word breath there is nashama mm. look at Wow, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Now, yeah. that's wonderful. Eh? So, Honestly, let's see. Let me stop sharing my screen. So, I, I don't have the ability to read the chat. So, if, if anyone wanted to also, please feel free to, like, you know, if there's anything that wasn't clear. Man, I just found so many connections. Like when you said that um, Adam hid his inequity in his bosom, I thought of heart, which is also akin to the psalm, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So really what Adam did was he took his, his doubts and his inequity, put them in the same place as the truth, and I think therefore purges that inequity and keeps himself pure and then another cool connection was you when you mentioned the king of tear i think i'm saying that right um uh, aka satan lucifer <laughs> right he he falls and that that's unforgivable and what often scripture reiterates is how forgiveness brings reconciliation so i think when he falls his his position is broken off apart from god and that, that can't be restored, but I don't think it's completely lost. Like all, all of that beauty that was invested in that person that God created isn't completely lost. Like it's still, there's still remnants 
and other people, mm. I guess, partake in it. So, well, like Satan or Lucifer himself can never get that position again. Mm. It's not like, I don't think all is lost. Mm. Just you can't be restored to that position. Like once like it, that position has been done away with it, it now kind of, I don't know. It's like a, a decomposition, like a, when a plant dies, it decomposes, but then all the good stuff goes into the soil and a new plant is grown. And like, and same with Adam, like when Adam falls, Adam and Eve both fell, right? It's not completely lost. You, you know, I love that you say that because it helps me remember, you know, S.A. Tan, his job was to cover, right? If you look at the Ark of the Covenant now, how many cherubims do you see covering the throne of Yahuwah? There's now two angels or cherubim, right? And they're, they're facing one another. If you look at it, they're, you know, they're, they're bowed down and they're sort of facing. So it's like, you know, Yahuwah has, yeah, you, that, that position was lost right, uh, that S.A. Tan had, and what I'm trying to highlight, and I hope I'll, maybe next week I'll be able to sort of finish my thoughts, is that that, his throne being established on earth, right, is now going to be demonstrated, I wish I had a better word, or illustrated in the Malki Zadik of Adam and Eve. And again, they are just the beginners. They are just the beginners. We know the culmination of this is Yahusha. But mercy and truth is the key. And I say all of that because I, I used Adam, uh, Eve, and even the serpent. The reason why I bring our attention to that is because I want us to personalize it because we are made up of spirit, soul, and body, right? So what we're going to see of Adam you're going to be able to be like, oh, wow, you, we need to be able to distinguish what is soul and what is spirit because there's a part of us that's a weaker vessel, right? There's a part of us that delights in the truth of Yahweh. Romans 5 or 8 talks about that. Paul says, in my inward, my inner man, I delight in the law of Yahweh. That is our spirit man. But there's a part of us that's, that we have to the truth has to guard because that's the soul part, right? The soul part, that's a representative of a weak, the soul. A weak the yeah, a weak vessel, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's why the truth, the Torah, is for the converting of the soul. And that is why in Isaiah 26, it says, my soul desires the remembrance of you, right? So the reason... And there is this aspect of harmony. And so mercy and truth, mercy and truth represents um, harmony. And, and I wish, you know, we'll talk more about that. But I want, you know, any further thoughts? There's something that, um, like, as you were talking, it was kind of like forming in my head. Um, mm -hmm. It is uh, an infantile thought as of right now. So I'm... Um, I'll try to see if I can kind of work on it a little bit. Yes. But um, so as you we were talking about like Adam and Hawa, right? Yes. Uh, Adam, uh, there was actually somebody um, who I was listening to. Uh, it's a group called Honor and Humility FTL. Um, and they, they're actually a pretty, pretty decent group. Um, there was a, a video that they brought out called the Divine... Um, power of a woman from a scriptural standpoint and it was amazing about like how how much detail they went into the virtuous uh the virtuousness of a woman and the fact that hawa right the word awa yes. means uh, to pervert and the fact that she came from uh, adam's rib right mm -hmm. and because of the actions in which that she took it did cause the um it caused on one half the beginning of the fall because then she brought it to adam right that is that is his uh technically that is his flesh that is his blood brought it back to him and i mean they they've been one you know so i mean 
he's uh the way that they they put it right was uh Hashitan knew that he was not going to be able to get to a dom so he had to go through hawa right because she is the inward part of him right and yeah. so through that he was able to attack both and um when you think about hawa hawa is the um the, i want to make sure i say it correctly um the video said that men are like electric beings and women are magnetic you know and so they uh, uh yes. she was able to attract him to um for lack of better words to make him docile or to you know put him at a um a sense of lowering his guard there we go his guard was lowered right if he is the warhead if he is the one that's supposed to be um up uplifting or keeping the law of the most high if there is something that is able to you know kind of put a wrench into that that's that's the um that's the route that Hasha Chan took. But anyway, to, to get back to the main point of it all, uh, Hawa is more spiritually innate, right? Like she, she feels deeper. She is, uh, or like the, the, um, feminine aspect, uh, it, um, oh, I can't, I cannot form my words right now, but, um, <sighs> I'm losing, I'm losing the train of thought. James, while you're trying to collect your thoughts, I want to share, and, and it's interesting you bring that up because I came across, I have never seen this before, and to me, so there's a bit of a, okay, I confess, right? There's times where I feel, and I think this is because of, I, I came from a Baptist um, denomination, and in the denomination that I came from, they really look down to, women saying things or we sometimes you're just quoting the word of yeah and you know that's preaching and they they think that you shouldn't do that right so i have a brother who is a, a trained preacher and he really thinks i should not be saying anything or should just be quiet right but it's amazing though because it is true that women is more intuitive more sensitive and this is the reason why Yahusha, risen Yahusha, showed himself to Mary, uh, to Mary, right? But I came across this, Jeremiah 31, 22. And I think some of the prophets also um, brought this up that, and, and as you know, Jeremiah 31 is, this is a beautiful chapter because this is the part where he says, you know, it talks about the covenant, right? But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and in those days says Yahweh will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Yah and she'll be my people. But before that, you're gonna see something that I don't know if you've noticed this before, but you know, it says, how long wilt thou go about O thou backsliding daughter for Yahweh hath created a new thing. Created a new thing in the earth. What is that new thing? A woman, you see that? shall compass a man think about that for a second what is that a woman shall compass shall I turn about to encircle to surround to make a side to back or towards all these beautiful words encompass surround but we're not talking a man where in other instances of this word man it's ish right here it's Geber. So Geber is a strong man, a warrior, a warrior, a Gabar to prevail, to strength. So when I saw this, a what in light of what you said, could Yahuwah be using woman to basically, I guess, remind, remind that um that you know that man has that we not man man that we are strong that we are you know that we are strength that we are we have gibor gabar in us right i think that that's what is do you think what is that the ruach yeah 
<laughs> the woman or the female is the ruach? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's it's the part right? Well, you know, I just bring it to your awareness, but I'm creating a new thing. And if, you know, James was saying that there is a divine calling for women. And, and this is why, even in my case, and I'm hearing a lot of this, you know, it's, it's women typically that, that is so sensitive to the word of Yahuwah, right? So this is why churches, like the or even if you look at organized churches, I'm not so sure anymore, but when I was there, a lot of the, the active, the engaged ones were women. And so what's happening is the man is the, the males, they're sort of, you know, not so active or engaged. So what happens is if you, if you think about it, who then takes the leadership of the woman instead of the husband in this, in a church setting, right? So it's the pastor, right? So it's, but the point I'm saying is we have this responsibility and it's not, you know, it, it, it says in the word, Yahweh is creating a new thing. What is that new thing? That a woman shall compass a man. And James, I don't know if you heard, I think you got disconnected, but this word man is not like ish, because ish has a different meaning. In the garden, when you look at, oh, sorry, not, you know, husband. Husband is, anyway, here it means gibor or gabar. So a woman shall compass a strong, a strong man. That's what I'm um, sorry if there's like a lot of background noise and unfortunately like I was trying to uh, reconnect and I was having some issues so hopefully you can hear me um, uh, two things like when it comes when it comes down to teaching honestly I feel like whoever the Ruach has been given to is to teach and then we have Romans 12 right the whole entire chapter of Romans 12 is talking about spiritual gifts and so on everybody has a gift you know yeah. and um, a uh, second thing too is uh, when you go back into Hebrew, right? So um, in Aramaic, I believe it's Ish. In Paleo, it's Ash. And then um, the woman is Asha. So when you have the Aleph, again, the Aleph in it, um, that you, you have Adam, who is Ash, right? It flows together again. So you have the Aleph, which is obviously what is first, um, yes. Ak, leader, so on you know and then you have the um the olive and the uh, yeah the olive and the hay that is added to the woman you know and yeah. to me like that gives it such a deeper meaning because of how important it is for uh like basically like the union of yeah. of both like you know man uh, man and woman um i feel like i'm like segueing a bit too far though <laughs> but oh, no. Uh, no it makes it makes sense to me because where I see it is, um, you know, they are meant to be um, husband and wife, or um, how do I say it? They're, they're supposed to be in oneness. Like that is, I can't think of any a perfect way to illustrate a kindness other than um, a, a holy matrimony, right? Like a husband and wife, because. You know, it, when it comes to, um, even when you think about it, when it comes to intimacy, right, that, that the intimacy between a husband and wife touches on a, a totality, right? So there's the spirit, soul, body that's taken place there. So there's that ikadness, that there's that oneness. And, and, and James, um, what I was saying earlier, and it's sort of connected to what you're saying is, um, mercy and truth is where I want to um, expound um, next Friday because, because of the iniquity that was birthed in SA 10. And we have to understand iniquity is something that is, like if you look at iniquity, right, it, it has the type of ramification that touches on the third and fourth generation. Like when, when mankind finds themselves in, in, in iniquity, you see how here, Exodus 20, it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation. And so not only that, look at the, 
you know, the iniquity in Genesis 15, 16, it says, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And we know the Amorites, it speaks of Nephilim, right? So point being is, Estee Tan started this iniquity business. And we have no full like, comprehension of what that meant in the, in the spiritual realm, but we see some of it on the earthly realm. But now Yahuwah wants to purge that. So I was showing, and maybe, I don't know if you can see this. Um, the point is, um, mercy and truth is going to preserve kingdom. That's what Proverbs 20, 28 says. Uh, says. Uh, mercy and truth preserve the king, and his throne is upholden by mercy. And it says here that mercy and truth is going to purge iniquity. So that is, so if, there is this mercy and truth concept that's going to purge iniquity. Man, I think that's something that that we have to have a good under we need to have a good understanding of because it is something to do with by understanding that we're going to see a little bit more deeper into who we are, into our person, right? Who Mashiach is, his person, the person of Mashiach, the the possession or the the place that's set apart for us in Mashiach and then who we are in our authority in Mashiach because okay, so yes go, go ahead. ahead no yeah, I was just one, one more thing, I was I was just gonna say it's so yeah. timely for us I can't even express how timely it is for us to understand how to operate in this manner in the spiritual giftings of Yahuwah in what's coming. Go ahead, sir. Sorry. <laughs> Raquel, go ahead. Yesterday, um, I had a conversation with, or we had during the fellowship that we were on, um, Sister Feichka from the Netherlands brought up a point um, because we were talking about the current events and everything that's going on. And she was talking about the name. For the person, the number, and the mark of, of the beast system and all of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think because the enemy is a copycat, he can't make anything new. There's also a name, a number, and a mark in, mm -hmm. in the Shia. Yes. And you're getting on onto this mercy and truth. The mercy, the way I see it, ultimately was his blood. Mm -hmm. And the truth is the truth of him and his fullness and who he who he is in our yeah. lives, and revealing the truth of Abba's word daily because he is the word. Every time we're reading this, we're reading about Mashiach. We yes. are reading him. And with each deeper revelation, each deeper truth, we're understanding the depth of his mercy. <laughs> awesome stuff. That's deep. Yeah, no? Yeah. I agree. Yes. You're on your it's like you're looking at my notes, Raquel. <laughs> but because you I brought that you're up. trying to be a cheater. <laughs> Because you brought that up, right? I want to make it like I, this is why I love the conversation because there are things that my spirit is saying, but it, my my mouth, my soul is taking a while to be able to express it. So I, my mind, I, I have this picture completeness in my picture of what I'm trying to say, but then my mouth is not catching up as fast as I would like it to be. But what you said is on point. You're talking about mercy as the blood, right? So Isaiah 16, 5, look at this, okay? And this is where the tabernacle of David, because this is where I want to end up taking us eventually. But again, tabernacle of David or tent of David is ohel. Ohel in the etymology of it means to be clear or to shine. So tabernacle of David or to be clear or to shine of beloved. That's basically what it's saying. So in other words, what's, what's unique about the tabernacle of David 
in comparison to the tabernacle that Moshe put in the for the wilderness uh, children of Israelites is that there's no division. The tabernacle of David, he was able to worship and approach the secret place of the Most High. This is where he was in Psalm 91. He was he had his tent up, and the Ark of the Covenant is in his tent, and he was. This is where he was expressing his worship. But well, in verse David five, was also a Melchizedek. Absolutely. He was operating in the office of the Melchizedek. Hold and, the phone. <laughs> Hold the phone. <laughs> okay. So, if the tabernacle of David, or what did you call it? The oh, hell or tent of David. Right. David beloved, means, in other words, means clarity. You said it was clear or shine. Yeah. That's so you have the clarity of the beloved as a Melchizedek. No division. There is right, but you work. you get to experience the full glory or shine yes. of the Most High as a Melchizedek. Why do you think there is no wow. sin? Why do you there's no sun in the kingdom, in the new Jerusalem. What what is Isaiah somewhere in Isaiah says, arise, yeah, yeah. shine. So it is in okay, let me just let the cat out of the hat. When I say tent of David, I'm really talking about our brain, our mind. Right? So we there is such oneness that Yahweh wants us to have in the image that he wants us to carry. So we cannot have this double-mindedness. So we have to have this oneness with Yahuwah. So there has to be no separation of shame, reproach, right? We are one with Yahuwah. So what he does, we can do here on earth, right? So, but going back to what you're saying about mercy, verse 5 in Isaiah 16 says, In mercy shall the throne be established <laughs> and shall sit upon it in Okay, and he and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David or tabernacle of beloved, judging, seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. Think about what this verse says. We know that the high priest once a year on the day of atonement would go into the mercy seat, into the mercy seat, into the Holy of Holies and would sprinkle the blood. So mercy represents the blood and the mercy will be on the throne is what establishes the throne. And what sits in the throne is truth. So that's why mercy and truth, that combination, that harmony of mercy and truth is key. And that is so, um, what's the word? That is something that was not um, present in, in SA 10. That was something that he did not, uh, how do I say that? Okay, maybe. He, he did not possess that. He did he, not no. possess that ability. He, he didn't. Put it this and way. He didn't have, he, he was made in such a state where he was so near the presence of Yahuwah. What he didn't really, he had a full awareness of, of his completeness. In other words, so Adam Adam, he was made complete, but he didn't have that full, full awareness yet, right? That's why Eve had to come out of him. So Eve was taken out of him so then he can exercise mercy and truth. So that he 